Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Give us a wave if you can hear me. That's good. <laughs> My name's Greg, and uh, I'm one of the guys who, who works here. So good to see you. Um, we're going to start as usual with our, uh, we start with our community prayer. So if you're a visitor, uh, good to see you. And uh, the words will come up here, we, we always uh, start with this together. And then uh, we'll get into a bit of time of worship and stuff together. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to ask uh, Stephen and Kelly to come up and uh, they're going to uh, lead us in the prayer this morning. So, here they are. I'm 
If you can see 
Patrick Curry is going to do another song.
kept us from the freedom that God has. And when we look back, we see, my God, you, you took that away from me. You, 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 you saved me from that potential pitfall. It's just so good. And so often we don't look back and just say, thank you, God. We're so needy in the present that we don't thank him for what he did in the past sometimes. Let's just spend some, uh, a few moments and just look back to the things that God has done, the, the things that he's rescued you from, and just, just thank him just in your heart and say, thank you, God. You delivered me from that. You give me victory in this area of my life. And let's just say thank you for a few moments before we continue. Yeah, God, we are grateful. You, God, you've heard the prayers of each one of your, your children in this place, God. You, God, we bring all these thanks to you. God, we can do nothing apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. God, we recognize that humbly. God, you have delivered us. Thank God, you offer us deliverance today, and you offer us deliverance for tomorrow, Jesus. God, you give us real power, God. God, way beyond self-help books and way beyond just motivational speakers, Jesus, we can come into your presence with assurance that the living God is present and loves us and delights in us. We receive that, Jesus. Speak to us now through your wonderful word. Amen. Well, have you guys seen those videos that come out at the beginning of each year? It's called Google Gear and Search. You seen those? They're always like pretty emotional. That's what people have searched throughout the year. Um, this one is pretty typical. It was a lot of COVID stuff and things like that. Um, and I watched it and I said, I'm not going to, I don't know about that one. I looked at 2014, year in search. <laughs> That's not that long ago, right? 2014? Do you guys want to see what it looked like back in 2014? Pretty unrecognizable to the Joel. Anyways, check this out. 2014, year in search. Did you do the challenge and look down at your body and think, incredible, what's <laughs> happening to me? <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it's so interesting looking back, isn't it? Because things that seem so important today, um, it's like, okay, within the view of sort of the, 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 the future, and when I look back on the past, are the things that I'm living for today actually transcendent? Here's a question for you. What church 
were you going to in 2014? Metro. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what was your biggest worry in 2014? Can you even think back to like, like you know like how there's this internal dialogue, this just program that's running in our heads all the time? It's hard to even remember what that would have been or when we look back upon it, sometimes they seem silly. What was the highlight of that year for you? When we just sort of like stop and take stock of where we want to be in eight years from now, it sort of changes how we live. What are our real goals? What should we really be pursuing? What, what should this year, what should I actually be resolving to do this year in light of the fact that so much of the past is insignificant? In 2002, do you guys remember um, David Pelche and Jamie Salani? Do you guys remember that? Do you guys remember they lost the gold medal because of basically a technicality in the French judge? Do you guys remember this? Yeah. This was a huge deal back then. We watched the documentary and the whole world just went nuts. Like angry. They were on like David Letterman, like Oprah was talking, everybody was talking. It's all that mattered was this gold medal that they lost in Vancouver. And, we're, and I remember feeling that way. And we're watching it and we're thinking, who cares? Who even remembers their names? I asked my children, they didn't know their names. Things that seem so urgent and important just sometimes aren't. So what should we be pursuing? King Solomon paused and took stock of his life and found that what he was pursuing was actually pretty meaningless. He just stopped and he said, okay, what have I been living for and what have I been doing? Listen to this. This isn't meant to be like a New Year's downer, but let's just breathe for a moment. This is an Ecclesiastes. Meaningless. Meaningless. <laughs> when, when there's an exclamation mark in scripture and you're reading it at home, you have to yell it, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, you're missing the original intention. An exclamation mark, I, I use them way too much just because I'm typically an excitable person, but they're meant to be shouted. Meaningless, says the teacher. And then, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north, round and round it goes, ever returning to its course. He's rambling. On purpose. He's going off. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place streams come from, there they return again, and things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye has never had enough of seeing, nor the ear is full of hearing. What has been will be again. What has done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is anything of which we can say, look, there's something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. Listen to this next lament. This one is interesting to me. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. That is a really interesting comment, that our fame and esteem and <laughs> prestige is very quickly forgotten. You guys ever thought about that? The heroes of our day 50, 100, 200, 300 years ago, we don't even know their names. And little of what we do week to week is memorable or has that much meaning. Have you ever thought about this? What we do at church week to week, we gather, but much of it seems to have little consequence. I can count on one hand the number of gatherings in my last 44 years that were consequential in my life. It's crazy. I've been reading this really amazing book called The Reappearing Church. And this book has just filled me with so much hope. Mark Sayers says this, by continuing with the status quo, we plug ourselves into the anti-renewal machine. Business as usual, the satiating of consumer Christianity, the more provision of pleasing religious goods and services. This is it right here, accumulating knowledge without putting it into practice will not bring renewal. We need our autopilot patterns interrupted. I think if I've had the same New Year's resolution year after year after year, maybe I need to change my resolutions. 
if what I'm looking for in this world is the same year after year after year, I would say that maybe I'm spiritually immature. I think that probably there's a way that is much more superior, and Scripture lays it out really beautifully. At our first dream sessions at BNA, I don't know if you guys remember that, that was a long time ago. We talked about King Jong Un's grandpa, Kim Il sung. This is him on the right. He was born into a Christian family. And this was a man who wanted to actually have his life make a difference. But as they looked at the church, they said that the church is full of just consumers and there was no expectation of societal change. He only saw Marxism as having real power. He saw the church as full of passive spectators. So he walked away from the church and into Marxism. Isn't it fascinating? Imagine how the globe could look differently if the church was the biblical church in North Korea back then. And I think sometimes I wonder like, Within this space right here, like what are we showing our children church is? And, and what are we showing just the city of Kelowna that this is what the church represents? So many people say, why does the church get tax-free status? What does it do for anybody? You guys ever hear that? It's a good question. So many people talk about the, the, the lack of passion that Christians have in the West. People Magazine called this the most important image in its magazine. It's this guy's name is Thich Quang Duc. This image was considered the image of the 20th century. This was the one. It creates so much emotion in people. He's protesting the volatility in Vietnam and he was willing to light himself on fire to get people's attention because this was his whole priority. He was wholeheartedly against what was going on in his region, and he said, that's enough. I'm willing to die for this. He was willing to die for something. The reason why people find this so compelling is because he's willing to die for something, and most people, they don't even know what they're living for. What are you willing to die for, would you say? I would imagine that all of us would say that they're willing to die for family members. Right, would you say that? I would. But what else are you willing to die for? And it's an important question because it also reveals what we're willing to live for. We're going to do a little bit of an experiment right now. And it's, it's pretty interesting. Who do we want to be as people? And what legacy do we want to leave? We can see it as we look back on the history of the church, the history of God's people in Israel. This is what we're going to do. When you hear the name of somebody that you know, if you know this name, I want you to put up your hand, okay? It's pretty simple. You're gonna hear some names. If you know anybody with that name, put up your hand, okay? Okay. This is Numbers 13. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am given to the Israelites from each ancestral tribe to send one of its leaders. So here's what's happening. He's saying, I want one, I want the best leader from each clan to go and spy out the promised land. The best, the toughest. This is what I want. So in the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. He is saying, I want the most famous man you got. And they all have them. They have these like great stories of conquest. So like they would send in the toughest guy that they had, right? So this is how it would be. We would send in like, we're sending Jeff Simla. So then Jeff would show up and they would be like, whoa, that guy. He's got a pretty famous history behind that guy. Well-known, muscular, famous. God said, I'm giving you this land. It's already done. You just scum it out. Okay. You want to hear the 12 guys? These are their names. Put up your hand if you've heard of the person. From the tribe of Reuben, Shemua, son of Zakur. Anyone? Do you guys know of a Shemua in your life? No. Go for one. From the tribe of Sidian, Shaphat, son of Hori. Anyone know a Shaphat? Go for two. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, son of Jephunneh. How many of you guys know a Caleb? 
Okay? I think that's everybody. Interesting. From the tribe of Ishakar, a gal, son of Joseph. Anyone know an gal? No one knows a gal. From the tribe of Ephraim, Joshua, son of Nun. Anybody know a Joshua? So says, that's a different spelling of Joshua. Anyone know a Joshua? Yeah. Know a Joshua? A Josh? Joshua. Okay, everybody. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, <laughs> son of Ruthu. I don't know Palti. That's a cool name, actually. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, son of Sodi. Anyone know a Gadiel? No. From the tribe of Manasseh, Gaddy. He's a loser. Gaddy, I'm a Gaddy. So this is kind of short. Gaddy, you know Gaddy? No. From the tribe of Dan, Amiel. Anybody know an Amiel? Do you know an Amiel? Amiel, he pronounces it, but uh... Hey, there's an Amiel in the house. From the tribe of Asher, Sethur, son of Michael. Anyone know a Sethur? No. From the tribe of Nephtali, Nabi. Uh, Nabi. I actually know a Nabi, but it's N O B. Yeah, you do too. Nabi, anyone know a Nabi like that? No. From the tribe of Gad, Gul, son of Maki. Anybody? So here's a very interesting thing. Everyone knows a Joshua. Everybody knows a Caleb. But we don't know of any of the other guys. You see, when Joshua and Caleb were called in, this is what happened. You guys all probably know the story. They all saw these fortified cities. These men were giants. They were, the, the fruit was so big, they would carry a grapevine on a stick between two men, probably on their shoulders. Huge people. The ten were freaked out and said, we can't do it. Joshua and Caleb said, but God gave it to us. Are you kidding me? <coughs> and only those two saw the promised land. They were no more talented. They were no more chosen. They were no more special, but they entered the promised land and experienced the best that God had for them. The other 10 were disqualified and missed out. And that's their legacy. Thousands of years later, we name our children after them. I, I, the middle name of our son is Caleb. Because I want him to have that, that heart of incredible faith and trust. We know nobody named Ghoul. If Ghoul was brave and went in and had that kind of faith, guess what? Everybody here would know somebody named Ghoul. Wouldn't that have been awesome? How about this? Here's, here's a sheet, I, I'm sorry, a, a list of all the guys that went into the promised land and we know nothing of. Christine Kane went to the Passion Conference and presented this list to, to tens of thousands of people and she said, does anybody know any of these names? And then they panned the arena. This was down in the south. And not a single hand went up. It's incredible. But the world is full of Shaphats and Nabis. But, but I want to be somebody who lives, and I actually want to be somebody who experiences all that God has promised. But how does this happen? It, it's not that we need more faith. It's not that Joshua and Caleb had faith that me and you don't have. It's not that they're braver than me or you. It's not. How do we become that? Because we're all thinking, you know what, I have anxiety. Every one of us in this room has anxiety. I do, and guess what, I'm not great. If you were to send a leader from Kelowna, there's no chance you would send me. If they're saying, okay, we need the best in British Columbia to go to Ottawa, who are they going to send? Guess where I would be on that list? Probably like now near the millionth or something. How many people live here? Three million. I'd be low. But here's the beautiful reality of it, is that God has actually promised us the exact same results that Joshua and Caleb had. And, and it has nothing to do with our effort. Listen to this. This was Ezekiel, this prophet, and he said there's coming a day in the future when the Spirit of God will fall on the earth, and this is going to be what you receive. He said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. This is big. I want you to take that, that word new spirit and remember that, okay? I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you 
and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This is a crazy statement. He is, this is God saying, there will be a day where I put my spirit, the spirit of God in you. That word, new spirit, is this word ruach. And it's this Hebrew word for spirit of God. It also means breath. It also means courage. When, when God created us, he, he breathed his spirit into us. It's that word ruach. Other times it's translated as courage. Isn't that so cool? This is what ha happened to, to Joshua and Caleb. Numbers 14 explains it. This is what it has to say. It says, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit, it's that word there, ruach. He's saying, because Caleb has a different spirit, my spirit in him, ruach, and follows me wholeheartedly, two things, different spirit, wholehearted trust, two things, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Not because Caleb has all this faith, not because he's so great, talented, smart, handsome, funny, nothing. It's two things. It's my spirit and wholehearted trust. It's the same two things that Ezekiel said that we need. It's because he has a different spirit and he follows God wholeheartedly. And each one of us in this space and at home, this is what we get this year. This is what Jesus said, John 15, 5. They're a bit out of order there, Natalia. This is John 15. It says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He is saying, if my spirit is in you, Ruach, you will bear fruit. It's not effort, it's a simple abiding. Trees produce fruit without effort. What are branches doing to produce an apple? They're just holding it. That's all. It, it's the roots that are doing all the work. It's the same as us growing hair. <laughs> Since we got here, how many of you put effort into growing hair? Anybody? Anyone? <laughs> have any of you guys thought, oh, I want to push this out? I've been trying for a long time. <laughs> we grow hair with no effort. It's the result of being alive. When we're attached to the vine who is Jesus, we bear fruit with no effort. Isn't that an incredible invitation? He said, stop trying so hard. Remain in me. Relax. Be. And you will bear fruit. This is what it actually means to have a different spirit, a new spirit. This is what Joshua and Caleb had. They weren't better than the other guys. They just were actually remaining and abiding in Jesus. They had a new spirit. And secondly, here, this is so beautiful. We try so hard, but this is Solomon. The exact same person who said, it's all meaningless, it's all impossible. He said, but this, this right here, this is how, this is how we bear fruit. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. This is a crazy word. Trust God with your money. Come on, that's hard. Trust God with our sex lives. Like, you know what? When people come to Jesus, this is the struggle that they have. It's like, okay, I am going to trust the Bible to make all my decisions. That's hard. Lean not on my own understanding because my understanding tells me to do all these things and God's word says to do all these things that appear to be different. Trust him in how we talk. It says trust him in all your ways. But this is Solomon speaking again here. And he says this is how we follow God wholeheartedly. And it's a work of God. Can, can I just be straight up? We can't. If, if you're thinking to yourself right now, oh no. Why are we talking about this stuff? I, I want to... 
I want to drink less this year. I want to... I don't want to just consume and spend all my money on Amazon and just waste the resources God has given me. I don't want to just live this year the same as last. I want to make all these changes and I feel guilty. You can never do it on human effort. Our New Year's resolutions are the worst because they all involve us having more discipline or trying harder. It doesn't work. But Jesus said, remain in me. And I will remain in you, and you will bear much fruit. It's having a new spirit. Do you guys see how beautiful that is? It's putting down the effort, which is religion, and it's remaining in Christ. It's so beautiful. The way of Jesus, there's so much rest in it. Proverbs 23, he says, come to me, follow me. You will, I will make you lay down in green pastures. Stop trying. Let me provide for you. I will provide a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Doesn't that sound better? Do you guys want that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Who's kid is that? <laughs> <laughs> Samantha. <laughs> the spirit of rebellion. <laughs> but here's what we're going to do. Is we're going to take communion right now. And Jesus invites us to have intimacy with him every day. Let me invite you to make your New Year's resolution for this year simply that. Abiding in Jesus. He will give you a new spirit and he will guide you into this beautiful way of wholehearted trust in him. Do you want that? Wholehearted trust? I want that. I want to just trust him completely. And my brain does not trust him. It doesn't. But when I'm filled with the spirit, I trust him. You guys ever notice the difference? When I'm filled with the spirit, when I abide in him, I hate the sin that wants to hurt me. This is what Joshua and Caleb did. They simply were just had a new spirit. And we're talking about them thousands of years later. These other men who tried to do it on their own power, I don't know one single ghoul in my life. Not even one. I don't even know one Shaphat or Gani or Amiel or Nabi. Don't know any of them. And I want my year this year to actually matter. I want it to be transcendent. And so I know that I need to remain in Jesus. And so we're going to take communion. And, and this is a powerful symbol. What we're doing here is we're inviting the very presence of Jesus to fill us. And what happens is that when we invite the Spirit, He's going to bring to light things in our lives that He wants to change. And it will lead to wholehearted trust in Him. And guess what happens? Is that as we, as we take communion, God is going to say, I want you to repent of this and walk away from this this year. Whatever that might be, he, he, he will enlighten your mind and then give you the power to break that chain. It's not our own strength, it's his. I'm going to pray and we're going to worship. As we do this, it's important to remember that he is... He is a father. This is how he chose to be known. He said, when you pray to me, pray our father who art in heaven. And the most dominant image that the New Testament presents to us is a loving father who is perfect. The prodigal son is the image that Jesus wants us to have in mind when we think of the father. That he's waiting for us. That he grabs us and he hugs us and he kisses us. And we try to come up with excuses and say, well, you know what? And he just says, no, you're forgiven. And he restores. He puts sandals on us because we're his children. He puts a robe on us to cover our shame and our stench. He gives us the family ring back. And he just says, you're welcome back. No strings attached. That's the father. Would you pray with me? So Jesus, you tell us to 
to fix our eyes on what is unseen because there is permanent and wonderful peace there. You say that nothing can pluck us from your hands. You say that turn our eyes away from the scene because those things are temporary, God. They're temporary and they're quickly passing away, God. Those generations are not remembered, God. The works that we toil for, the businesses that we build, the reputations that we create, they all just crumble, Jesus. What is unseen is eternal and permanent and can never be changed. Father, I pray that this year we would run after the eternal. God, I pray that you put a new spirit in each one of us, God. Just a brand new way of seeing the world. And God, that that would lead to wholehearted trust. God, as we just consider your love and your beauty for us, God, I pray that you just reveal to us areas in our life that you want us to turn over to you and trust you with. In the precious name of Jesus. Yeah, amen. We're going to sing the song, and I invite you to just hold on to those elements for now. When we're done the song, Graham is going to um, and just invite us to take communion together at that time.
necessary just to trust you for everything, to put our dependence upon you. So we just uh, want to take this bread with those uh, as representative of your body. We thank you that you said that um, we should uh, eat this in remembrance of you. So together as a community, we take this in the name of Jesus. Good. We uh, we want to have a bit of time right now for open mic. We uh, we really value hearing from from people and, and and we really value your voice. I mean, obviously at this time, um, what we want to do is we still can't do it because of Omicron, but is to have lots of like we basically be having <coughs> meals together every morning, and that's coming. Remember that message I gave where we talked about the word companion. The word companion actually means like coming together over bread. Panny is the word bread. And we really believe that like, we can't just come into a room together and say, we're community, we're family, we're making friendships, but we're really not. So we recognize that this isn't the ideal yet, but it's coming very soon, right? Yeah, COVID's going to take a real dip here. I could just feel it. Anyways, <laughs> uh, we would love to hear from you in the meantime, though. So um, if maybe you have a prayer request or maybe a victory or maybe God's done something in your life or just... There's just something you want to share. Michael's going to lead that for us, and he's going to sort of explain how this works. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael. Uh, so, open mic time, like Joel was saying. Uh, so there's a couple guidelines that we kind of want to keep to, just to keep it uh, you know, relatively safe for everybody. Uh, so please limit sharing to just two to three minutes, so more people have an opportunity to share. And um, we are a diverse community of all ages. Um, so, you know, trying to keep sharing to appropriate for everyone here. So, yeah, we'll open it up 